Well, uh, good morning to you guys, and um, welcome to our campuses. And um, in all seriousness, Wes, Wes is going right over here. Wes, give us a little wave. You're leaving the service. He's going to be out there in the lobby. Um, what he said is so true. It's not anything that I'll say in the message. It could be that the Spirit of God has already spoken to you. You're overwhelmed of your great need for salvation through Jesus. And I just encourage you, if you need to get up right at the beginning, like, I don't need any more. Like, I just need Jesus, and I need to make a commitment to him. You can just make your way out. I don't care whether people around you think you're going out to get a cup of coffee or a banana at the cafe or whatever. You just do what you have to do uh, to experience the Lord. And uh, I, it reminds me of a story I heard of a pastor that was sharing with me. said, uh, he asked a person in his congregation, he said, uh, well, how did you come to know Christ in our church? He said, uh, he said, well, they were passing the offering plate. And he said, a kid dropped the offering plate. And he said, it must have had a lot of coins. And he said, it just was going everywhere and made all this racket. And said, I just knew at that point that like, I needed to give my life to Jesus. And I, I, I'm like, if God can use the dropped offering plate, he can use anything. So for whatever reason, as God prompted that and Wes to say that, I encourage you. Uh, to just go out there. If you need Jesus, just go out there and he'll talk you through what it means to be in a relationship with the Lord. As uh, we've come into this place, haven't you been just absolutely awestruck by the great weather that we've got today? It, give God some praise for that. Uh, I don't normally do this, but in between services, I went out and did like a lap around the parking lot. It was so beautiful outside. Take your copy of the scriptures and I want you to turn to Psalm 22. Uh, take your program in hand as uh, you write down some of the insights that the Holy Spirit will give to you. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this uh, 22nd Psalm. Uh, first of all, it's quoted seven times uh, in the New Testament. Uh, David is the writer of this Psalm. He's writing it about a thousand years uh, prior to actually Jesus coming to earth. And it's different than some of the other Psalms. Some of the Psalms are more wisdom Psalms. This one is messianic and prophetic. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, messianic would mean it points in the direction of Jesus. Prophetic means that it's giving just a glimpse of things that will happen in the future. And so as you look at this 22nd Psalm, you're going to discover some things. If you like a prophecy based on what we see in Daniel and uh, the book of the Revelation and other places in the scriptures, you're going to absolutely love this because we'll discover that this was given a thousand years before. But it's like you're there at the crucifixion of Jesus. And so we want to get into this. Now, as David being the author, you, you've heard about David being the uh, king of Israel. You've heard about David um, being a man after God's own heart. Uh, we know it's from David, as we find recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus would be born from his lineage. But you probably, if you're like me, I have never picked up on this in Scripture, that he also, according to the Bible's understanding, was a prophet. You say, well, where in the world do you get that? Do you remember on the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching and 3,000 people were going to get saved? That there was the words, the message that he was giving, and Peter, as he gives this message filled with the Holy Spirit, he says, beginning in Acts 2, verse 30, he says, being therefore a prophet, and he's talking about David, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Peter's saying, I I've seen Jesus alive. But I want you to understand this. There is proof in what we see in Psalm 22 that points everything in the direction of what was to come. Now, let me ask you to write down a, a key phrase for interpreting Psalm 22. And it is very simply this. It is partial fulfillment for David, but complete fulfillment in Jesus. In other words, there are some things that we'll see as David writes this. But he's writing these words as if he's there and he's moved by the Spirit of God. But it's not his story. It's the story of David so, or the story of Jesus. And so it's partial fulfillment in David, full fulfillment in the person and the work of Jesus. Now, what have others said about this particular psalm? Let me give you some quotations. Martin Luther said this, founder of the Reformation. It is a gem among the psalms. 
James Montgomery Boyce said this, it's the best description in all the Bible of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, this is beyond all others, the psalm of the cross. We should read reverently, putting off our shoes from off our feet, as Moses did at the burning bush, for if there be holy ground anywhere in Scripture, it is in this psalm. Now, it is not, you might think, when I go through and read this passage of Scripture, you might think of some of the situations that David faced. But it's not David in a time of sickness. It's not David as a soldier on the field of battle. It just screams everything of what we see of a man being executed. And I would tell you this, that the Spirit of God prompted David to record these words so that we could understand in this prophetic sense everything about who Jesus is and what he's done. So there are very simply two divisions. If you'll look down through uh, this Psalm 22, you'll see verses 1 through 21. And then there's a whole shift in what we see in verses 22 uh, to 31. The first part of Psalm 22 deals with this, everything about the cross. The second part of Psalm 22 deals with this, everything about the resurrection, everything about what happens after Jesus is in the grave, but now he's resurrected. And so with that in mind, I want us to embark on this journey. Now, due to the length of this passage, and if you're a little bit like me, because many of you have acknowledged throughout the years, in fact, I guess pastors sort of draw people that are similar in them. Many of you are probably sort of ADD, attention deficit disorder. And so if I read the whole thing, you'd zone out by about verse 5. So I'm just going to read for you like five or six verses at a time. How many of you would appreciate that? That'll help you keep focused in and zeroed in. All right, great. Here's the first division, the over sort of the title, overarching theme of this. It's prayer in a time of suffering. Prayer in a time of suffering. We, um, every few weeks, we'll have our granddaughter that's three years old, Ellie. She comes over to the house. And uh, if she gets up from a nap or wakes up in the middle of the night, it's always interesting because she begins to call out and grandmothers and granddaughters have this special relationship and connection and she'll just start calling out because she's in an unfamiliar room she's in her guest bedroom and she calls out for Beth and she'll say mama 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 and when Beth opens the door she says the cutest thing in the world she says uh, mama I lost you and uh, Beth said well I'm right here honey I, you, you don't have to worry about it any longer in this passage of scripture we see a child calling out to a father. We see Jesus as the Son calling out to God the Father and wondering what is happening in regard to his suffering. Verses uh, 1 through 5 talks about how Jesus was forsaken by the Father. I, I was reminded of this the other day that when Christopher, our oldest son, was uh, in his preschool years, he fell and hit his head and required some stitches, and so we took him over to Lewis Gale Hospital, and, and I remember that he was crying, he had calmed down and everything, but the doctor looked at me and he said, uh, I'm going to have to put a few stitches in his forehead, and I, I just knew he was going to scream bloody murder, and yet the doctor looked at me and he said, but you're going to have to hold him down. And I, I remember that look of horror in his face, and I remember having to hold him there as the doctor placed those stitches in his head. And, and, and I think after the fact, he trusted in me, he had confidence in me, but at the time it was excruciating. Look to the scripture of what we see, of what happens on the part of Jesus, that in this opening verse it says this, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God. I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Several times the word trusted is used, but we wonder why did Jesus have to trust in the Father? It's because of what happens. In, in verse 3 it says this, talking about God's character, you are holy. And when Jesus took my sin and when Jesus took your sin upon himself at Calvary's cross, remember the Father had to forsake him. He couldn't look and behold him in his sin because Jesus was the sin bearer of all sin, past, present, and future. And in that moment, Jesus felt forsaken. Simultaneously to that, he trusted in the Father. 
And there's this agony that's taking part as he calls out to God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason that he was forsaken is for this reason. It's so that you and I have the ability to be forgiven. Had he not turned his back on the Son in his holiness, we would never have that capability of being forgiven of our sin. The second insight on prayer in a time of suffering is this, is Jesus was despised by people. Jesus was despised by people. It was pretty interesting. I had this conversation at Life Group. And by the way, uh, with Gary Witt, uh, who's one of our Life Group members, and he was telling me about something that I had never heard of before. It was called the Crimson Worm. And then I listened to a, a message by John MacArthur that affirmed sort of the whole understanding of the Crimson Worm. And I, I, it caught my attention in verse 6 because it says this, I am a worm and not a man. That's an interesting phrase. We, we think about a, a worm, those fragile creatures. In fact, as I walked around the parking lot just a few minutes ago, I noticed from rain that we had had earlier in the week that there was the worm that had gotten out there. And, you know, they always rise to the surface, crawl across your sidewalk, across the driveway or whatever. And then when the sun comes out and beats down on them, they become shriveled up and disfigured. And in this passage of Scripture, it's saying this. Uh, Jesus identifies himself as a worm. One of those most fragile of creatures. And you would think that the word worm would be very simple in the Hebrew, that it would be translated the same everywhere, but it's not. It, sometimes the word worm is translated as crimson or scarlet. And I think about the way in which it gives us an image. There is a tiny creature in the Middle East. It's called the crimson worm. You can look it up and Google it and discover more about it. But this crimson worm, uh, what they would do is they would collect these worms, and as those worms were crushed, it, they would secrete a fluid that actually would stain clothing and garments with this red, scarlet, crimson hue. And the imagery is so great because... What happens in the life of the crimson worm that as it lives its life, it will take and it will fasten itself upon a, a tree or a branch or a, fin, a fence post. And, and it will cling to that. And in the final days of its life, it, it, it's, it will give birth to its babies. The babies actually live off of the living body of the mother. And then it dies and it secretes this fluid that not only stains and transforms those little babies to the same color that the mother is, but it also stains and impacts the tree itself. You can see this imagery as you look to the screens that th this is actually what happens to a tree that ha has had that crimson worm upon it. And some of you are already making parallels and Aptly so, because we discover this, that Jesus, as he went to the cross of Calvary, as he was there and he was pierced for our sins, and as he paid the sacrifice, we acknowledge this. That Jesus, his death on the cross, his being affixed to that cross, gives us the ability to experience life. It's Jesus' sacrifice and blood that provides the ability for you and I to experience life and transformation. And he transforms not a piece of fabric, but the fabric of our human hearts. Some of you are here today. Some of you are at one of our campuses. And God's already touched and spoken to your heart. And you realize you have never experienced the forgiveness and the change and the transformation. I'm telling you, you don't have to leave this place. You can open up your heart and your life. You can surrender to him and all things can become new for you. Not because of any words that I say. Not because of any music that you've heard. Not because how you've been aroused emotionally. But because of the Spirit's work in your life that you're convicted of your sin and your need for Jesus and you want to get to the place where you, you just open up. And for some of you, this it could be a life transforming day. Verses 6 on down through verse 11. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. 
all who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. You, you can just detect the body language that's given here that there's, there's this scowl. There's this shaking of heads. There's this, this animosity. And there, then what they say verbally, not only the body language, he trusts in the Lord. Remember when they did that is they passed by Jesus hanging between heaven and earth. You heard it earlier. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. You say God's your father? Let God come to your rescue. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Think of all that's happening when we think about how he was despised by people. The soldiers beat Jesus. The religious leaders wanted him crucified. The Roman government gave and leaders gave their permission to do so. And who, who was actually responsible for Jesus' death on Calvary's cross? Was it the Roman leaders? Well, yes. Was it the Jewish religious leaders? Well, yes. But equally as much, I'm responsible for Jesus' death on the cross. And so are you. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might have and experience the righteousness of God. He was the perfect one that went to Calvary. We can't pay. If we try to pay the penalty for our sins, you know what we'll experience? Death and hell and suffering and torment for all of eternity. That, that's why the nature of this message is so important. And so we see Jesus was forsaken by the Father. He was despised by people, but I also want us to look at Jesus was condemned by crucifixion. Jesus was condemned by crucifixion. As I read this next portion of Scripture, you're going to find that he was despised, but he was despised on all levels. There were these evildoers. He's going to describe them. Remember, this is poetry. This is artistic. This is in a musical format. And as the psalmist as David writes these words inspired by the Spirit of God, he's going to talk about lions. He's going to talk about oxen. He's going to talk about bulls. He's going to talk about dogs. All these different things that, that it says down through this passage. Verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Uh, why, why bulls of Bashan? It, it's interesting. In fact, the Golan Heights was in the news just this past week. And uh, that's the area of Bashan now. And and in the Golan Heights, they have, there in the Middle East, a greater degree of rainfall, which means that the grass is greener and more lush than other parts of the Middle East. So that equates to, then, the livestock that feed there are bigger and stronger livestock. And David writes these words, These strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring Lion, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Do you remember that many when crucified, would, because of the way in which the nails are through their hands and feet, many of their body parts, their, especially their shoulders sometimes and their elbows, would come out of the sockets. Continues on in the passage of Scripture. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. When, when it says that, you know, my jaws are like this, I thirst. Jesus said those classic words as he was on the cross, I thirst. Verse 16, for dogs encompass me. These are not the pets like we enjoy. These were wild, ravenous Wolves that would go and would try to surround people and rummage through the garbage in those towns and villages. A company of evildoers encircles me. They, and it's probably talking here about the Roman soldiers. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. Have you ever seen photographs of those Holocaust survivors in those uh, Nazi concentration camps, and they were so emaciated that you can see and count, and you can do the same thing if a person's wasted away through cancer, and you see them in those final days. Sometimes we will actually use the words, hey, they sort of, they're just skin and bones. And you can look, and you could actually literally count their ribs. This is the reference because of the dehydration because of everything that Jesus has experienced on Calvary's cross. I, I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. That was the Roman soldiers. 
But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I want to go back. I want to talk about this. The, the, the thing that amazed me as I studied this text is this is that David writes in the Psalms about in verse 16, the last part of that verse, they have pierced my hands and my feet and they have divided my garments among them and for my clothing they have cast light. When we think about this, it would be an addition. Remember, David wrote these words, 1000 B.C., but the Persians wouldn't come up with this form of execution known as crucifixion for another three to 500 years. It just shows us the way in which the Spirit of God... Were. These weren't just... They, they were human authors, but they were writing based on what the Spirit of God uh, showed them and revealed to them. And so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, he not only forecasted a thousand years before, before the, even this way of capital punishment had, had been contrived. And the Persians invented it, but then Roman authorities perfected this. And, and then, and you, you, you see how living this is, how much it points to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And then there's this whole change. It, it, it moves from this understanding of prayer in a time of suffering to now the second part of this psalm is praise in the time of victory. Praise in the time of victory. That This is where it turns the corner. It, it goes from what happened on the cross to the, really the the resurrection of what we find in Jesus. It goes from this understanding of His suffering to this victory and praise of God. It goes from the, the Son of God being nailed to a cross the three days later. And it, it gives us, it never uses the word, because remember, this is poetic. It's, it, it's, it's imagery that we discover, but everything in these last verses screams of Jesus being risen from the dead. What, what was it? Think about it. We're just a few weeks off from Easter weekend. And as we think about that, do you remember as those disciples came and Mary appeared inside that tomb and Peter and John came there, there would be this understanding that they would celebrate together and they would get to the conclusion, He is not here, He is risen. That's the excitement, that's the enthusiasm, that's the way that we have, that's the hope that we possess. Because Jesus isn't dead on a cross, Jesus has been risen from the tomb. And how do we see this? For three things that I want us to see about this. First of all, there's the celebration of God's people. There's the celebration of God's people. He is risen. And it talks about in these upcoming verses about this great crowd, about this wonderful congregation, that all the saints of God that have gone on before us, that they're there and, and they're experiencing the grandness and gloriness of a risen Savior. What's the biggest crowd that you've ever been a part of? Could be a concert, could be a sporting event. For me, it was 1997. 22 years ago, my dad and I went to a Promise Keepers event up in Washington, D.C., and there were a million men that were between the Capitol and the Washington Monument. And I remember just, it, to me, it served as one of those little glimpses of what we see that's described in the, in the Bible of that great heavenly experience that we have. It talks about it here in this text. Let me go back to what it says, beginning in verse um, 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him and stand in awe of Him. All you offspring of Israel, exclamation mark. For He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. For He has not hidden His face from Him, but has heard when He cried to Him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. Two times, verse 22 and verse 25, it says this. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. From you comes praise in the great congregation. The book of the Revelation tells us this. That one day, there will be people from every language, every tribe, every people group throughout the entire planet. And people for all time, because it tells us in the book of Philippians, 
that one time in the future, in a prophetic sense, there will be every person, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the great way in which we see this sort of a whole allusion to the resurrection of Jesus himself. It's found through the celebration of God's people, but it's also found in this way, the anticipation of a feast. They're gathered together, but now they're going to feast. They're going to enjoy one another's company, the Lord's company, the fact that He is risen, but also there is this anticipation of a feast. Every time I go down to Myrtle Beach, I think of one or two places that our family always has to choose between. One of those places is Krabby Mike's because we like all-you-can-eat crab legs. The other one is Rio's because I like all-you-can-eat steak. And we always choose between one or the other. And, and even the other day, if you've never been to one of those places at Myrtle Beach, uh, I just it'd be like, comparatively speaking, you go and eat all you want at the home place restaurant. We were going there the other week with, with friends. And uh, I ate a protein bar for breakfast and I ate a banana for lunch because I was saving up to eat at the home place. And... <laughs> And when I was on my way, I felt like one of Pavlov's dogs. You know, you studied that in college. It was like I was salivating. Like I could feel the juices in my mouth just in anticipation of this great feast. And, and I think of it. Yeah, <laughs> preach, brother. And, uh, and I think about this anticipation that not only do we have the Lord's presence, not only do we have this great, all the believers that have gone before us, but we also have the privilege to eat Jesus even in his resurrected body, sat with his disciples and ate fish with them. And I'm thinking one day there'll be this wonderful heavenly family reunion where we have the ability. What, what good would our holidays like a 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, what good would it be just to be gathered with family and not be able to eat? It's the anticipation of it, of being in His presence. And, and sometimes, now we ought not be gluttons. Let me, let me just work this in here. We ought not be gluttons, but we ought to experience that, that our eating together and our being together among the bride of Christ in heaven one day, that we don't have to eat, but I, I hope and praise God we will be able to eat. Just this anticipation. Continue on down through the passage. And notice the variety of people. When I read these verses, 26 to 29, all the ones where it emphasizes not only eating together, but the satisfaction that comes from being in the presence. Some of you aren't here, and you're not satisfied with life because you've never come into a personal relationship with Him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and Turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over all the nations. And then I love this in verse 29. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. In other words, those that have affluence, those who have a lot, those that are blessed, before Him shall bow all who go down to the dust. And then it, there's a comma. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. When it comes to the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter about your status, about your economic circumstances that you possess in life. Both the prosperous and those that couldn't feed themselves and starve to death that were believers and followers of Jesus will one day gather, be gathered before him. It just attests to that in the scriptures. I, you say, well, how do you get all this about this passage of scripture? I, I, I had never known this. I didn't know that David was a prophet. But let me tell you another thing that I didn't know about this text. When a Jewish individual would come to the tabernacle or the temple and they would bring a peace offering, there would be a certain portion that was there for the sacrifice that the priest would take. But the priest would also cut off a portion of that, give it back to the person that had brought it so that they could celebrate with family and friends and they could invite who they wanted. Now, it leads us to this last understanding. You've been invited to the table. There is nothing that's more lonely or disappointing than spending the holidays sort of by yourself. And I'm telling you, when it comes, spiritually speaking, you don't ever have to be by yourself. There is one that has invited you to his table. And this is why it closes on the tone of, there, this is a message for future generations. Verses 30 and 31. I, I love the fact that as a church family, we are for the Roanoke Valley. And uh, we're for the Roanoke Valley in regard to we're being four families. 
and, and uh, we're for schools and we're for meeting needs and we're for community. And really that's talking about it's a grander scale than just for community in the sense of our local communities. It's for this. We want you to have community with Jesus. If I had to put a hashtag on this, it wouldn't be for the Roanoke Valley. It would be this. Because it ends with this tone of really uh, of evangelism and outreach and, and making an impact and, and sharing and spreading the gospel. It would be this hashtag. Hashtag for future generations. Jesus is for you. He loves you and died for you and sacrificed himself, but he has risen from the dead so that you could experience forgiveness of sin and newness of life. Verse 30 begins this way, posterity, what is posterity? We don't use that, it just means all future generations shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness. Not our righteousness. Our righteousness, the Bible describes, is his filthy rags. But we proclaim his righteousness. That he who was the spotless lamb of God, he who knew, knew, knew no sin, became sin for us and died on Calvary's cross. To a people, I absolutely love this phrase, to a people yet unborn. They, this is the prophetic sense of this passage of Scripture. To a people yet unborn, that the reason that we pass the baton of faith from one generation to the next is because there are people that will need to know and come to saving faith in Jesus himself. And then it closes with this. That he has done it. Bible commentators would tell us this. That the semantics in the Hebrew are very similar and very akin to what we would discover in John chapter 19. And you're probably already thinking, maybe the Spirit of God. When I say those words, he has done it. You're probably thinking of the words that Jesus said, the last words on the cross. It is finished. Everything for our forgiveness of sin. Everything for you to experience a transformed life is because not that we're righteous, but because a righteous one died for us on Calvary's cross. In just a few moments, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. We're going to remember. And I, in fact, when I when I was preparing and was studying this passage of Scripture, and it was not one that I knew a lot about, but on Monday I. I was studying Psalm 22, and I, I said, uh, I looked at Wes, and I said, uh, Wes, I had dropped by the office, I said, uh, it'd be really good if we could experience the Lord's Supper and communion this week. I mean, it fits so well with this passage of Scripture. He said, it's already scheduled. And I thought, what, what a way for us to know and to understand that God's at work behind the scenes. That God is at work behind the scenes. And He's orchestrating details. And He's orchestrated the detail of your being in this service today that you could respond to His grace and forgiveness and you could surrender your life to Him. Is that you? We're going we're gonna to do something. It's two forms of really commitment and remembrance. One is those of you that just have absolute surety that you know Christ as Lord and Savior and you've crossed that line of faith and you've committed your life and you just know deep down that you know Jesus. In just a few minutes after I pray, you're going to go to one of these stations here on either side or at the back of the room, but you know that there is a different kind of response that you also can make. That is... Because we always invite baptized believers, people that know Jesus as Lord and Savior, to take part in this observance of the Lord's Supper. But every one of you, you, you uh, it, it could be that you need to commit your life to Jesus. And then you need to go to one of these tables to say, now it's become real for me. I want Pastor Kevin, he's going to be over here to my left. I want Pastor Robbie, if he'll come right over here to my right. We've got some care team members. If, as you're in the service today, would you just stand up? And uh, would you just make your way right there to the back of the room and uh, right there at the sound booth? And uh, Kenny, if you'll go back there, and that'll be great. And you may be closer to the back of the room. But, but this is what I want you to do. After I pray in just a moment, some of you know by everything that's happened, you just know unequivocally that the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And you need to surrender to Him. I can't convince you, I can't persuade you, but some of you just know it's been a long journey. Some of you might have been in church for years and years and years, and maybe the gospel clicked, the good news of Jesus clicked, and like, it makes sense. I can't try to be good enough. 
Jesus has been completely sufficient what he's done on the cross. And his Holy Spirit is speaking to you like you need to surrender and you need to surrender today. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Vicki Henderson's right over here at the doors on the way out. Kenny's right here. Uh, Robbie's over here. Pastor Kevin's right here. And so after I pray, if you're sure that you know Jesus and you want to remember the sacrifice that he made, come get the elements and then go back to your seat and we'll observe it together. But if you're unsure or you just know today's the day of salvation, I'm going to ask that you, as you get up, your first step will be to one of these individuals to say, I need Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the work of your spirit. We thank you for the clarity and the truth and the good news of the gospel that in spite of our badness, in spite of our sin, you paid the sacrifice for us on Calvary's cross. Even though you became a worm on our behalf, we thank you that you are now risen. You give new life. You were that crimson worm to transform our eternal destinies and transform the direction of our lives. We thank you for this. We give you praise. In Jesus' name.